hopefully Lena could come and give this presentation today. Um, she's been called away on business. As you might know, she's one of the leading scholars on giants in medieval literature. So there has been an incident in Norway and she had to take off and deal with the trolls. So uh, she asked me to fill in a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Charlie Weasley and I'm a dragon expert. <laughs> How does one become a dragon expert, you might think? Well, I always thought dragons were kind of cool. So when I attended a Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, my favorite subject was care of magical creatures. Um, so after I graduated, I sought to work with dragons. I started working at a dragon sanctuary in Romania near Domoglet Valiaciani, so I have lots of experience. Um, so, uh, the title of my talk today is uh, Dragonstone, Blood and Tongue, Medieval Perspectives on Magical Properties of Dragon Parts. And I'm trying to incorporate the uh, wizard and the muggle perspective. If you uh, have been paying attention in class, you might know a little bit about dragon blood. Um, dragon Parts have a fuckload of magical power. For example, um, Aldous Dumbledore, Hogwarts headmaster, as you might know, researched this together with Nicholas Flamel, and they wrote the uh, leading essay on the 12 uses of dragon blood, uh, which has been published in 1927. Some of these uses include oven cleaner, spot remover, and a cure for warts. But also, um, dragon blood has healing properties. Here you see Hagrid applying a dragon stake to his face after being beat up by his half-brother Rob. Dragon height, blood, heart and liver and horn all have highly magical properties. This is also the reason why dragons are at risk of being illegally hunted. Because they are sought after potions ingredients, black market trade and dragon blood reached its peak during the war. Thankfully, trade is more regulated now, and most dragon-based ingredients come from programs focused on beast welfare. But uh, my second favorite uh, subject at Hogwarts was muggle studies. Um, and I've always been fascinated by uh, muggle literature. Um, you might have known uh, the book um, uh, Fantastic Beasts. Um, it is uh, written by Newt Scamander. And uh, there's uh, an interesting quote um, in Fantastic Beasts about muggle bestiaries. Um, so the section is called A Brief uh, History of Muggle Awareness of Fantastic Beasts. And Newt writes, Astonishing though it may seem to many wizards, muggles have not always been ignorant of the magical and monstrous creatures that we have worked so long and hard to hide. A glance through muggle art and literature of the Middle Ages reveals that many of the creatures they now believe to be imaginary were then known to be real. The dragon, the griffin, the unicorn, the phoenix, the centaur, these and more are represented in muggle works of that period, though usually with almost comical inexactitude. However, a close examination of muggle bestiaries of that period demonstrates that most magical beasts either escaped muggle notice completely, or were mistaken for something else. So today I'm going to talk about why dragons are being depicted as evil in medieval muggle literature. Um, uh, you mentioned this briefly in your introduction. Uh, the Middle High German uh, Nibelungenlied is uh, the first topic of our conversation, um, in which the hero Siegfried fights a dragon. So the muggles got some of the facts right. For example, the bit about the blood. Um, here we have a, a, a person in the Nibelungenlied, Hagen. Um, do you know anything about the Nibelungenlied, perchance? Have you, does anybody ring any bells? No? Okay, then I'm going to give you a little bit of context, maybe. Um, so uh, Siegfried is um, the hero of the story. And he enters uh, the court, uh, uh, which holds the maiden which he wants to woo, Grimhild, which he will later marry. But um, he's not known at court, so um, Hagen, another hero. Yeah, you know Hagen? What? No, no. Grimhild is his wife. 
That would be weird. That I want like the black family, right? <laughs> Incest. No, we don't do that. Um, um, yeah, let's not talk about wizard genealogy. Um, so Hagen uh, spots Siegfried out of the window, uh, and he says about Siegfried. So this is a translation from the Middle High German to English. I know yet more of him. It is known to me that the hero slew a dragon and bathed in the blood, so that his skin became like horn. Therefore, no weapons will cut him, as has full oft been seen. So this is the first bit we get to know about uh, Siegfried in the story. Um, this is the <coughs> screenshot from uh, the Fritz Lang uh, movie about uh, the Nibelungen Sage. Um, it's from 1924, it's a silent movie, it takes a lot of patience, but it has some epic scenery and a fully animated dragon. So this is the dragon costume the muggles used to actually simulate a dragon in the movie. And uh, there were six people sitting inside this model, operating the dragon, which uh, smoked a lot. They had to cough inside, and yeah, that was pretty horrible, but uh, got some beautiful cinematography done. So here we see Siegfried uh, taking a bath in the dragon blood, and, uh, but there's a little problem with that. So um, later in the story, Kriemhild talks to Hagen, uh, because she's worried about her husband uh, going off into battle. And Kriemhild says to Hagen, she spoke, my husband is brave and strong now. When he slew the dragon on the hill, the lusty warrior bathed in the blood, so that since then no weapon can ever cut him in the fray. When the hot blood gushed from the dragon's wounds, and the bold hero and the good bathed him therein, a broad linden leaf did fall between his shoulder blades. Therefore I am afraid that men may cut him there. So Siegfried cannot be wounded anywhere except where that damn leaf fell, and uh, that's also going to be his downfall. Um, because Hagen um, uh, is sort of uh, giving Kriemhild the illusion that uh, he will protect her husband, uh, says to Kriemhild, threw a small mark upon his coat, whereby I may know where I must guard him when we stand in battle. And Kriemhild, she weaned to save her knight, but she was done unto his death. She spoke, with fine silk I'll sew a secret cross upon his vest sure. There, knight, thy hand must guard my husband when the strife is on and he standeth in the battle before his foes. So, um, you see what's going on here, right? So, uh, Kriemhild wants to protect her husband, but Hagen is like, yeah, mark the spot where he's vulnerable. And <laughs> that turns out not to be such a good idea because, um, yeah, um, we will find out later. Siegfried becomes invulnerable after bathing in the dragon's blood. Weapons cannot pierce his skin, which is said to become like horn. Uh, that's hornhaut in German, yeah? So he's like, gets really thick skin, not in the figurative sense. Um, we have addressed the regenerative properties of dragon blood before. Um, here, the medieval epic is somewhat inaccurate. Bathing in dragon's blood might give one a remarkable edge in battle, since it instantly heals wounds. Um, so m that might probably last for some time. This effect, I haven't tried that out because I don't use dragon blood naturally. Um, I'm a vegan. So um, unfortunately, Siegfried is betrayed and murdered by his enemy Hagen, and Kriemhild later goes on to slaughter him and his friends because she takes revenge. So hell has no fury like a woman scorned. So enough about the uh, Nibelungen Lied. Um, this is probably one of the most famous uses of dragon blood in uh, medieval Muggle literature. But there are also some lesser known sources, uh, which I will show you now. Um, so let's take a look at the medieval bestiary. Does anybody know what a bestiary is? Yeah. yeah. Have you heard yeah. of it? It's the, isn't it just like a, a book of beasts? Yeah, basically. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's sort of uh, maybe um, bestiaries are like encyclop encyclopedias, uh, so like uh, lexicon in, in Germany of the um, beasts and uh, uh, um, yeah creatures therein. They assemble knowledge of various topics such as animals. Um, and one popular and widespread encyclopedia in the Middle Ages is uh, called the Etymologie. Uh, that's the etymologies in English, um, that means uh, the origin of the words in the translation. 
because the origin of the words are also uh, inherently connected to the meaning of the thing. So that's a medieval thing uh, people did. Um, and Isidore of Seville is uh, the famous encyclopedist in um, the medieval ages. He wrote uh, the, the, the bestiary a little bit before that, um, the etymologies, but it's still uh, very popular in the Middle Ages, around 1200 and so on. So the entry um, in uh, the etymologies about uh, dragons says, the dragon is the largest serpent and in fact the largest animal on earth. Its name in Latin is Draco. Yeah, you mentioned that, right? But it actually comes from Greek, uh, Drakon. When it comes out of its cave, it disturbs the air. It has a small crest, a small mouth, and a narrow throat. Its strength is in its tail rather than its teeth. It does harm by beating, not by biting. It has no poison and needs none to kill because it kills by entangling. Not even the elephant is safe from the dragon. Hiding where the elephants travel, the dragon tangles their feet with its tail and kills the elephant by suffocating it. Dragons live in the burning heat of India and Ethiopia. So, as you can gather from this, muggles had some weird ideas about animals. In their bestiaries, animals are often likened in allegory to Christian knowledge. So this is how dragons and elephants became enemies, because the entry about elephants says, and here uh, is the accompanying picture to that, um, about the elephants, when it is time to give birth, the female elephant wades into a pool up to her belly and gives birth there. If she gave birth on land, the elephant's enemy, the dragon, would devour the baby. To make sure the dragon cannot attack, the male elephant stands guard and tramples the dragon if it approaches the pool. So what does that mean, right? That's not something we know about either in wizard or in muggle uh, modern history. So the elephant and its mate represent Adam and Eve in Christian allegory. When they are still uh, without sin in the Garden of Eden, they did not mate, but when the dragon seduced them, and Eve ate the fruit of the tree, also given to her by a serpent. Yeah, so dragon, snake, not all good, right? So when the dragon um, uh, gave that to them, they were forced to leave paradise and enter the world, which was like a turbulent lake of pleasures and passions. So that's kind of the, uh, the connection uh, behind this image uh, between the elephant and uh, the dragon being enemies. But that's a very popular uh, topic in medieval literature. So um, here's what Isidore says about dragon stones. Draconites um, is a stone that is forcibly taken from the brain of a dragon. And unless it is torn from the living creature, it has, it has not uh, the quality of a gem. When Smagi cut it out of dragons while they are sleeping. For bold men to explore the cave of dragons and scatter their medicated grains to hasten their sleep, and thus cut off their heads while they are sunk in sleep and take out the gems. So why do they do that? Why do they take those stones? Well, because they do stuff to them. Um, for example, Albertus Magnus in his Liber Secretorium uh, talks about these uh, stones. Take the stone which is called Draconites from the dragon's head. And if the stone be drawn from him alive, it is good against all poisons and he that beareth it on its left arm shall overcome his enemies. So it's believed not to act uh, unlike a bezoar, which you might have heard of. Uh, that's a stone taken from a goat's stomach and it cures all poison. Um, but this is an absolutely barbaric practice, right? Cutting into his head while the dragon is still alive. So this led to a pretty horrible persecution of dragons. Um, even in their own caves, they couldn't feel safe anymore. So uh, thankfully, uh, this has been banned now by the Ministry of Magic. Um, also, you'd be really foolish to try cutting anything out of a living dragon. That's like a death sentence. And also, you'd have to deal with me if you try that. <laughs> so um, here's another example in... Uh, medieval muggle literature. Um, this is uh, uh, the uh, work uh, Tristan, um, made by Gottfried von Straßburg. 
And this is also an uh, Arthurian romance, uh, which with knights and dragons and castles and all that stuff. Um, so Tristan, the hero of uh, the epic, grows up in Cornwall and tries to win a bride for his king in Ireland. Um, but in order to prove himself as a knight, he, has fir he first has to rid the kingdom of a dragon. So far, so good. Um, so uh, what happens when uh, Tristan encounters uh, this dragon? Um, I will read the translation for you. He saw a thing that pained his eyes, the grisly dragon. Belching smoke, flames and winds from its jaw, like the devil's breath it was. It turned and came straight at him. Tristan lowered his spear, set spur to his horse and thrust the spear through its gullet so that it tore through the jaw and barely stopped at the heart. And indeed, it was an army in itself. It took smoke and steam into battle with it and other equipment in the shape of fire and teeth, and also claw, claws with which to strike so sharp and finely set that they were keener than a razor. The murderous reptile soon reached a point where it began to lose heart. He raised, so Tristan raised up its feet and plunged his sword into its heart beside the spear all the way up to his hand. And this the dying monster let out a roar from its throat, as grim and grisly as though heaven and earth were falling. And its death cry echoed far over the countryside and greatly startled Tristan. Yeah, well, slay a dragon, don't be surprised when it yells in agony. With, with as much effort, um, uh, Tristan goes on to do something else. He wrenched his jaws apart cut off from the tongue in the cavity as much as he wanted with his sword and thrust the piece into his bosom. So he actually hides this under the armor. So um, why would he do that? That's weird, right? You kill an animal, you maybe eat it, but you don't cut off its tongue. Um, we will find out soon. So um, this is a, a, a picture of uh, this uh, happening. Um, uh, there is a, a very, very fine castle down in Südtirol, which is called Burg Runkelstein, which has uh, some medieval illustrations. Um, there are hardly any left, so if you get a chance to visit there, you should definitely see this castle. It's pretty badass. And um, there is uh, lots of frescoes and uh, cycles about the uh, Tristan and other um, stories that were popular in uh, medieval literature. So here we see him uh, doing the unspeakable. He rips out the dragon's tongue. And uh, afterwards, uh, this happens. Of course, he just had a huge battle, so he's kind of exhausted and hurt. He was hard put to it to keep alive. Into a pool, he dropped all in armor as he was and let himself sink to the bottom, leaving only his mouth above the water. He lay there day and night for the cursed tongue which he had robbed, um, uh, robbed him also of his senses. The fumes alone that assailed him from it ravaged his strength and color so that he did not leave that place until the princess delivered him. So from a wizard perspective, the thing with the poisonous tongue is of course utter hogwash. Yeah? I told about the healing uh, properties, but this is not it. Dragons breathe fire, but they are not toxic. So get that out of your heads now. Um, rather, Tristan took this tongue as a sign of victory. So in uh, medieval literature, cutting off heads of slain enemies and monsters is customary uh, so as to prove their death and uh, boast about their defeat in order to further their own position at court. So this was like a trophy to take with him, presumably because uh, other parts of the dragon were like way too heavy, so he couldn't carry them home. Um, also, uh, the tongue is poison. In order for the story to work, here's another picture uh, from the cycle where he keeps the tongue close to his breast um, because uh, Tristan uh, has to be cured by two women, both named Isolde, uh, mother and daughter, um, and one of which uh, he will marry, uh, and this, uh, well, uh, marry off to a king, actually, and then he betrays uh, the king with Set is older. So this evolves to be one of the most complicated cases of adultery in modern history. Um, all women in this epic are named Isolde. I can't blame him, it's really hard to keep track of the individual uh, women. So, um, 
um, as I said, this is uh, this is very um, unusual and also I think kind of made up. Um, but let's examine why muggles uh, thought like this about dragons. Um, why is the dragon uh, depicted as an evil being in medieval muggle literature? And so Christianity is to blame. Um, and because uh, there are several parts in the Bible uh, that says dragons are bad. For example, this is about the paradise that I just quoted to you is a snake, but as we uh, learned earlier, snakes and dragons are sometimes inseparable in myth. Um, and also a dragon is mentioned in the apocalypse. So the last books of the Bible, sort of like the equivalent to Ragnarok, you talked earlier um, about uh, this is the revelations where everything goes to shit. Um, the, the word ends um, and uh, the Bible reads uh, like this. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and on its head seven diadems. So, so this is a woodcut by Albrecht Dürer, um, which shows uh, the uh, sort of uh, a crowned dragon with the horns um, and the seven heads. This actually goes back to a mistranslation to the Latin original, which sort of propagated throughout the Bible translations, because cornu, uh, which means horn in Latin, and coronata, which means uh, crowned, read sort of the same. And then uh, in the translations, people mix that up. So um, dragons usually don't wear crowns. Um, but um, the dragon goes on to uh, like basically uh, destroy everything. Uh, his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So dragon is the Satan in the Bible. Um, also, the snake, its relative, tempts Adam and Eve and makes God expel them from paradise, so that's both pretty bad. And in medieval legends, the dragon also represents the devil. So uh, this is not a good thing, obviously. It's sort of like bad publicity for dragons. Um, you might know uh, St. George, the dragon slaying saint, maybe. And um, this is a picture of him uh, doing his thing. Um, he's still depicted in many coats of arms, statues, and gives his name even to a part of Hamburg. Do you know which one? It's in the city center. It's called St. Georg. So that's named after, after this guy. So uh, medieval legends and biases about dragons are obviously still around. Um, to sum up, what did I just tell you? So dragon blood has healing properties. Um, the Nibelung lead got that part right. Dragon stones cure poison, also correct, um, as propagated in many encyclopedias and alchemical works in the Middle Ages. But dragon tongue is not poisonous. Um, Trist if anything, Tristan should have regenerated faster after combat. If he like does the thing that Hagrid did with his face after he got beaten up and he is wounded from battle and he presses the dragon tongue to his chest, he should have stood up in like no time. But um, as dragons are depicted as evil in medieval Muggle literature, um, because of the dominant Christian background in the Middle Ages, dragon is Satan. Uh, so um, some of the works are heavily biased. So this is uh, it for me. I told you a little bit about medieval Muggle literature.